started. Um, so hello, my name is Catherine Queen Taylor, and I am a PhD candidate here at, um, in the Department of Philosophy at the University of Alberta. Uh, and I'm also a graduate assistant with the Situating Science Cluster Grant. And I'm here today chatting with Dr. Frank Stanish at uh, The University of Calgary, where he is a historian of medicine and neuros, uh, of neuroscience, and he's um, also the Alberta Medical Foundation and he, or holds the Alberta Medical Foundation and Hannah Professorship in the history of medicine and healthcare there. And uh, some time ago, Dr. Stanish was here at the University of Alberta giving a talk on um, on German neuroscientists. And uh, I was wondering, actually, Dr. Stanish, if you could say a little bit about that talk, which unfortunately I myself didn't make it to, but uh, we thought we would put together this little interview as kind of a, a follow up with that talk, which was particularly fascinating. And I know many people here at the department or at the University of Alberta very much enjoyed. Absolutely. So uh, good morning again. <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, the uh, talk was uh, part of the uh, lecture series that you had um, at the U of A um, uh, that was funded by uh, the Situating Science Cluster. And um, the talk was, in fact, uh, entitled What the Escape of Neuroscientists uh, from Nazi Germany Tells Us About Modern Science. And um, in the preparation for the talk and also the communication with the node organizers in Alberta, mm -hmm. Um, in fact, the part of what it can tell us about um, the modern um, uh, situation and um, context of science was made much stronger. Um, even though I had it in the back of my mind that I wanted to talk about it, um, perhaps it's a little bias of a historian of medicine and science. Yeah. That you always try to, to keep to the actual um, a specific context um, of um, medicine or science developments uh, in a particular time, um, I think there is really a lot um, that this um, uh, particular case history uh, can tell us about uh, the modern foundation um, of biomedical mm -hmm. science. So um, what I'm particularly interested in this project um, is um, the forced migration of um, psychiatrists and neuroscientists, uh, most of which were of Jewish origin, some were um, communist socialist uh, opponents of the Nazis in the 1930s and 40s, um, and a few other individuals who um, primarily being on fellowships uh, abroad in North America, um, didn't return um, to Nazi Germany because of the political um, conditions. And um, some of the uh, pre-development um, uh, of the political situation in the early 1930s had to do um, with new laws that um, the Nazi regime um, inaugurated right away from the start after they had seized power. And um, so I was ex exploring a bit the um, cultural context um, of this developments or these developments um, in the early 1930s. Um, and explained um, that right early on, um, in um, April, on April the 7th of 1933, a new law was inaugurated, and it's quite complex. It sounds um, very um, neutral. It was the law for the re-establishment of the um, civil service in Germany, and it meant uh, that non-Aryans could no longer work in the civil service. Now, uh, one has to understand when looking at um, the uh, situation of the um, uh, German countries um, that um, academic jobs and research jobs in all major research institutions and uh, equivalents for general hospitals as we know them in North America were all uh, run by the government. So that meant uh, when the law um, came um, in the beginning of uh, April 1933, that um, so many leading uh, individuals um, who belong to this group of Jewish scientists and other scientists um, uh, opposing uh, the Nazis were suddenly forced out of their positions. <clears throat> some um, were even incarcerated, uh, were brought to prisons, um, and I gave some examples of that, um, like that of the famous um, neurologist Kurt Goldstein, uh, who uh, was somewhat uh, incarcerated right away from his uh, outpatient clinic um, into 
one of the Gestapo um, prisons. And um, some could actually continue, uh, physicians in particular, to work in uh, private practice. But usually this meant they could only be physicians for uh, Jewish patients, um, yeah. but not for uh, German Aryans um, at that time. Many tried to escape. Um, so I um, mentioned also some of these complex um, ways out uh, of Germany. and. Um, some of the thesis um, of the talk um, was that um, we're tending, and also the scholarship has tended in the past, to think of migration phenomena uh, in the modern sciences as being somewhat uh, science uh, neutral. Uh, what this science neutrality means is um, a, an inherent assumption that you can transplant a scientist um, from a place A to a place B without really taking the context um, into consideration. And um, I think what really this case study can tell us um, is um, the situatedness of science, uh, which for some um, particularly historians, philosophers, and sociologists of science um, might be um, a very um, uh, self-explaining um, situation and um, uh, event. Um, and um, we find this bias, particularly in the concept of brain gain, uh, the brain gain theory that was brought uh, up by um, scientists as well as historians of science in saying that uh, the events of the 1930s and 40s had led to somewhat a science neutral uh, brain gain uh, for North America and particularly Britain um, at the time. So what we have in mind is um, for the sciences in general, individuals such as um, um, Albert Einstein uh, being transplanted uh, from mm -hmm. Berlin to um, Princeton and uh, in these elite institutions could continue in a very regular way um, uh, in their scientific research without any breach. So that's the assumption. It can be done um, at neutral cost for the individuals. And um, for the neurosciences and psychiatry, probably the equivalent is Sigmund Freud um, being ousted from Austria after the Anschluss in 1938 and uh, having fled to London, um, where uh, he tried to recreate <clears throat> his psychoanalytical work and uh, community, but unfortunately, uh, as we know, due to his um, very bad health at, at the time as a cancer patient, uh, died um, one and a half years uh, later. So um, that, I think, gives us um, already an idea about um, how complex um, some of these um, developments have been. And mm -hmm. um, I was giving in the talk um, three examples. Um, I will only briefly <clears throat> mention the individuals. And I also said at the talk um, that they were um, like typologies or could uh, work as examples um, to help us understanding what these individuals have faced. So um, with the project in general, I'm trying to move away from this <clears throat> again, scholarship bias to look only at the very successful um, scientists and physicians uh, like Einstein or like Freud, um, but also um, like to explore, um, perhaps in the Kuhnian term, uh, the more um, normal scientists. Um, how did this uh -huh. uh, whole process affect the work and the productivity and um, the so-called success um, of the uh, scientists um, at the time? The first example I talked about was um, Franz Josef Kalman, a uh, geneticist uh, psychiatrist uh, who became one of the uh, forefathers, so to speak, of genetic psychiatry and siblings research uh, already in Germany and um, all the more in America. And the interesting example there is, um, although he was very successful in his research, um, this led to a clash with other uh, emigre um, psychiatrists, particularly the, the psychoanalysts, who suddenly mm. uh, began to question um, this new paradigm of biological and genetic psychiatry um, in particularly emphasizing um, the Nazi um, context. So um, um, questions about uh, euthanasia, uh, eugenics, and forced sterilization, and later on, of course, um, the murder of patients, as this happened, mm -hmm. as being part of this biological psychiatric enterprise. So um, mm -hmm. Kalman and the psychoanalyst somewhat um, went uh, heads to heads. And it's interesting that Kalman was more successful in North America 
among the community of geneticists and not so much uh, among the community of clinical psychiatrists. The second example um, I've chosen was that of uh, Eric Kandel, who became in 2000 the millennium, uh, one of the millennium uh, Nobel Prize laureates. Uh, again, a highly successful individual, but I think the interesting um, um, assumption we need to make about him is um, that he emigrated after high school graduation in Vienna. And although mm -hmm. always, um, for example, in his autobiography, um, 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 In Search uh, of Mind, claiming um, the psychoanalytical and the cultural context um, of um, Vienna at the time, received his uh, medical education uh, in North America, particularly in New York, and somewhat took up um, the style, um, worked with the network of his uh, supervisors um, and um, also colleagues, and um, someone was in that sense set on a different track than many of the emigres who arrived, for example, in later stages of their careers. Or, um, of course, um, issues of gender are played into that, um, that many of the female scientists and physicians who could have been very successful individuals back in Germany and Austria um, had mm -hmm. to struggle uh, more or less for just their ordinary living conditions. And the third example is that of a senior um, a neurologist, uh, Kurt Goldstein, whom I've mentioned before, uh, who was uh, someone a, a forefather of so-called um, holistic um, neurology, um, which we could perhaps for a North American audience um, translate into psychosomatics, uh, with a very strong focus mm -hmm. on both sides. Um, so for him, um, the understanding of neurological diseases uh, was as important as the understanding of the psychological and the social context in which such diseases um, arose. What is interesting in his example is um, that although he um, received um, a prominent academic position um, as a professor, clinical professor um, at Columbia University, um, that he no longer had um, some of the interdisciplinary uh, institute um, uh, behind him <clears throat> that he was, or program, research program behind him <clears throat> that he was used to uh, work with um, while being back in Frankfurt and Berlin before uh, emigrating to North America. Uh, he arrived in New York um, with um, 59 years of age, so um, he more or less had only six years before his retirement. And uh, mm -hmm. it's really interesting in his example, uh, he really tr uh, tried to um, sort of roll the stone up um, the mountain uh, all the time and recreate his research uh, program by working, for example, with the New School of Social Research, um, the, psych um, the philosophers and social psychologists um, in New York. Um, he um, had a private practice, uh, partially for private patients. Um, he used the money to reinvest into caring for the poor um, of uh, the Lower East Side um, in New York. And he started a small research laboratory, um, a two-person laboratory at the Montefiore Hospital in Brooklyn, um, while also lecturing widely um, on the East Coast. Um, so in trying to be establishing some of an inter interdisciplinary approach to the neurosciences, as he was used to, uh, he somewhat uh, stretched too thin, in a sense, to the, um, uh, engage with these various um, research yeah. activities. And it's interesting that in his case, as for other cases, um, the reception history, unfortunately, was one um, that um, he was very partially received um, by the neurorehabilitationists, by the aphasiologists, and um, to a very small degree also by diagnostic uh, neurologists. But the idea of holist neurology, putting it all back together, um, the psychosomatic approach um, didn't really make it over to North America uh, because of these constructs. So these, these have been my examples, and of course in the talk, as here, um, it is not enough time to uh, flesh out the like, whole complexity, which I'm trying to do um, in a monographic uh, book that I'm writing on this issue right now, um, about um, these cultural underpinnings of science that are so visible in the issue of forced migration and uh, of neurologists <clears throat> and psychiatrists um, of the German-speaking countries um, at the time 
um, but it gives us a good understanding, I think, also for some developments that we're currently seeing in um, migration uh, processes um, in the sciences um, widely. And I guess the, uh, uh, from the talk, the take-home uh, message was um, to look a little closer at some of these pitfalls, uh, the constraints, and um, often enough also personal tragedies um, when, for example, um, migration occurred due to political changes, um, as we also had seen it um, you know, during the time of Soviet Russia, for example, or might even now see it um, in um, uh, the situation um, of the Ukrainian uh, conflict. Um, to only name a few of such uh, situation, uh, situations where um, the migration to other countries <clears throat> is not really um, self-chosen uh, by the physicians and scientists, um, but um, they are uh, becoming really kind of a, uh, a playing ball um, of, mm -hmm. uh, of history. Um, thank you so much for that. So this is fascinating to me uh, in so many ways, in part because my own work deals with the history of medicine um, and then looking at contemporary medical practices. So looking at the way that um, historical medical practices have have developed the way that they do and such that we have kind of the contemporary medical setting that we're in today. And um, at the same time, I'm, I'm actually currently right now teaching philosophy of science to like a 200 level course. And the majority of my students are science students and engineers who are taking it as their arts requirement. And they have, it, it's, it's been such a fascinating process for me to teach them in part because uh, I also should say I have a background in microbiology. And so they have a very kind of, they come into the class with a very strong sense of this value-free ideal of science. And this, um, I, I think, it, which kind of fits with, in part with, or relates to this idea of kind of the value, or, or science value neutral science and science neutrality, right? Like that science is kind of the same everywhere, that scientists just kind of move from lab to lab, but each lab is kind of the same and cut off from the world in some way. Yet, they also do have a very ingrained sense of the social structure of the lab and of science. So they kind of can see that and they, they really feel it. Uh, but there's something weird and problematic to them about seeing that as contingent or as, as kind of not natural or not neutral itself. Um, yet then when we look at examples from the history of science, the importance of the social and political context of society at large, but also the context of the lab is so clear and undeniable. And, and I found like there, it, it's, um, it's obviously compelling, but it's also very discomforting for them to kind of acknowledge that as true. Uh, and so um, one thing, I, and so I, I should say, like, I, I love work like yours insofar as I find it really important and helpful to be able to show that, right? To kind of have people who are doing that work who can show those connections. So we can say, like, we need to actually really pay attention to these things. Uh, and in some ways, what I really liked, you, you talked about kind of the situatedness and, and noted that that seems kind of like a common sense idea. Like we can just all kind of accept that, of course, we're, you know, we're all kind of situated with regards to certain social and political contexts. But it's not really until you kind of look at examples of that, that the starkness and the importance of that becomes clear. Right, that it, it's not just this kind of, of course, we can just put it in the background assumption. Um, and so I was wondering and hoping if you could say a little bit about, I guess, what, what first attracted you to this kind of work or how you got kind of interested initially in the history of medicine and maybe talk a little bit about um, why you see this kind of work as important. I think you kind of alluded to that or made some threads, connections to that, but I was wondering if you could talk about that in a little bit more depth. Absolutely. Um, I mean, it's, it's fascinating that you uh, just mentioned uh, your teaching experiences um, with the uh, science and engineering students. And um, I guess um, it is a very oh uh, similar experience here <laughs> from a history of science and history of medicine perspective. Um, 
that the students on the one hand um, are um, identifying um, some of these social factors. If, if we think about hierarchies um, and how they are perceived to uh, behave uh, in a laboratory as well as in the clinic, um, in a clinical ward, or in a small group session mm -hmm. um, together with the patient, um, that um, they are also picking up on uh, what is so often called um, the role model uh, nature of particular forms of small group uh, interactions, um, so um, that they are trying to emulate um, some of the role models that they are seeing. Um, perhaps it's a little bit more visible uh, in medical education, but I believe it's also visible to a degree um, if only one looks hard enough um, in the hard sciences and experimental sciences as well. Um, and um, then there is also the recognition um, that, yes, um, historical changes have occurred. Now, definitely what we're doing right now, whether it's human genetics, um, whether um, it is um, evidence-based medical research, um, that this is uh, structurally very different uh, from how um, medical and um, experimental science um, was done even in the 19th century. Um, so, although it's often uh, perceived as being some of the foundation of these modern uh, paradigms, um, students soon see um, from looking at particular examples um, that changes have occurred. And um, there is a similar irritation, as you've just mentioned, in terms of, well, where are we now uh, mm -hmm. with respect to these changes? Not to mention um, the whole long uh, history of Western um, medical and um, scientific development uh, since the ancient times. So not, not really going there, um, but um, there is this, um, this observation taking place. And as for history um, of science and medicine, um, I believe it's often um, this astonishment um, that um, there is a very different approach there in some of comparing um, situations now, 2014, to perhaps um, the um, immediate um, um, uh, post-war period or even um, the 19th um, century. Now, um, as you've asked um, um, how I got interested um, in this issue of um, uh, the history of, of science and, and, and medicine, um, it is interesting um, that um, that was connected also uh, to somewhat a biographical um, uh, observation. Um, I started um, my um, undergraduate and graduate studies um, in uh, medicine and uh, philosophy of science and um, particularly worked in an analytical uh, framework um, of the philosophy um, of science. Um, and did my master's degree um, at the University of Edinburgh. Now, Edinburgh was, was very interesting for me because the philosophy department was very much analytically oriented. Um, with philosophers of science there at the time, um, like um, Alexander Bird or um, Peter Milne, uh, who were um, uh, also um, philosophers of logics, um, philosophers of... Um, um, of language, and at the same time, um, I'm sure you know, uh, there was the Science Studies Unit um, that was an independent um, uh, unit um, looking at um, the social underpinnings um, of science. And I realized, um, while being in the philosophy department, sneaking over, so it was just on the other side of the street, um, that something very different was uh, looked at, taught, and discussed um, at um, the Science Studies Unit um, with people like uh, David Bloor and uh, Barry Barnes being there. And um, I got fascinated by these concepts such as situatedness of science, um, science as a uh, science in context, um, and um, uh, the mangle of practice, um, those issues um, being discussed there, um, because I thought <clears throat> you had mentioned um, values in science. Um, I thought that um, mm -hmm. uh, those values are in, um, <clears throat> in the philosophical context, particularly at the time, um, the 1990s, um, are not uh, discussed enough. Um, 
when it comes to uh, philosophical assumptions um, of uh, the sciences. And um, but I thought it had much more to do what the Science Studies Unit uh, was analyzing with my own um, experiences um, in biomedical labs um, as a medical student on uh, medical wards. So I became fascinated in um, uh, the methodological underpinnings and the uh, situatedness of science um, from a social perspective and um, also in the historical uh, context. Um, so I should say, until then, I hadn't really um, uh, done uh, historical work or um, read specifically into the history of science. Um, so I guess uh, the Edinburgh experience uh, kind of brought me into this. And um, I also began to appreciate uh, those philosophers more um, who um, used historical cases uh, for their analysis. At the time, um, for me, that was uh, reading Imre Lakatosh, uh, uh, reading uh, Larry Loudon's work, for example, um, and um, I'm seeing <clears throat> that the philosophical frameworks themselves, um, which were somewhat taught and, and used um, in the analytical framework, were themselves a product um, of a particular historical um, situatedness of the philosophy of science post-1945. Uh, um, and um, I guess since then, when I'm returning back to Germany, that was at the time when I began um, my uh, dissertation um, on the history of experimental physiology and its beginnings um, in France in the early 19th century, um, the questions that intrigued me were both methodological, how did this new methodology appear on the scene that wasn't there in the 18th century? And um, <clears throat> also to ask about the specific practices that went along with doing laboratory work um, in 1820s, um, in the 1820s in uh, Paris and France, vis-a-vis um, -vis, uh, to laboratory work, um, if it can be called like that, in the 1780s uh, in the German countries, or later after uh, the 1850s um, all over Europe. Um, and I realized that, um, I guess that's a, somewhat a, a personal perspective, um, that I found it had much more to do with the actual um, uh, processes of science and the structure of science and could, uh, had more explanatory power for me and my, my own questions um, than a lot of the uh, some value neutral uh, language that was used um, by um, analytical philosophers of science by the time. I believe that has changed uh, in as far as I'm following um, that literature and, and reading it. Um, but um, for um, the latter part of the 20th century, I think um, there was quite a disconnect between the historical and um, uh, sociological perspective um, on science and the philosophy yeah. of science perspective. Right, Pro definitely. I, I, I mean, I think that is definitely true. Um, uh, although it's interesting to me in some ways in that I, 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 would, I see a lot of people who have actually taken that up more seriously, these concerns about um, the situatedness of science and the value Unrelatedness of science as occasionally kind of being relegated as doing feminist science studies as opposed to straight up philosophy of science anymore. Like you know, I think there is this, this kind of acknowledgement of this background in in straightforward analytic philosophy of science, but I do wonder sometimes about how serious how seriously they engage with that point as opposed to kind of acknowledging it and moving on sometimes. Um, but actually, one thing I wanted to ask you about, because you do also work with folks in medicine, and I, I, I thought it was interesting that you made this kind of um, distinction between perhaps the hard sciences uh, versus the biomedical sciences. And I have a, in my own work, I kind of work on the occasional disconnect between biomedical scientific research and then clinical practice and the way in which concerns in the clinic, practical concerns in the clinic can lead to kind of, um, 
I wouldn't say it's like a, it sets up the questions differently than for individuals engaged in kind of like physiological research or biomedical research. And so I was wondering if you find, um, since you kind of work sometimes with folks on both sides of that, do you find that there is a difference in terms of their concerns about these issues or their approach to them? Absolutely. Um, so I guess there are a number of uh, perspectives um, on that um, question. And um, probably the most prominent one that, that springs to mind is that um, medical practice is inherently social. Um, so um, doctors deal with human mm -hmm. subjects and patients, um, and um, it has become more and more an interdisciplinary approach. Um, so they're relying on other uh, professions um, for their um, help, uh, in a sense, and assistance. Um, and um, this has also shifted in a way that um, sometimes the other professions are more professional for a specific question when it comes to laboratory assistance or um, highly uh, specialized um, nursing um, uh, individuals um, when it comes to uh, uh, paramedics, um, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think there is an increasing realization um, that interprofessional understanding. interprofessional learning is necessary and that this approach um, is inherently a social affair. Um, so if the project of the modern um, sort of highly um, technologized and also um, highly expertise dependent um, medicine um, shall be uh, successful, um, mm -hmm. an integration is necessary. So I think from a from a medical perspective, um, that is inherently clear um, somewhat from the start, and is also part um, of the curricula for uh, medical students and health sciences students, for example. Um, but when looking at the sciences, um, the human aspect is often left out, um, perhaps with the exception, for example, areas like um, neuroscience, psychology, or anthropology, biological anthropology. Um, the purposes of comparison here, um, but when it comes to um, biology, physics, mm -hmm. chemistry students and engineers, um, the human subject um, is somewhat of a second or even a third order uh, question um, in what they're doing. Um, so rather a question of how can we, the scientists, relate um, our knowledge to uh, uses, demands and needs. Um, uh, um, the um, wider population has out there, in a sense. Um, but for um, uh, <clears throat> uh, physicians, uh, clinical researchers, uh, it is always part of their um, um, daily experiences. It is within their context in which they're um, engaging. So um, in that sense, I think from the start, um, as you have mentioned, the questions are set up in a very different way. And perhaps also there is a higher likeliness to understand um, uh, issues such as the situatedness um, of science in a, in, a, in a medical clinical context vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the actual research context. Um, but I do sense um, that there are also uh, oppositions, if not to say antagonisms, um, between the various perspectives um, that um, Sometimes um, clinical research yeah. isn't perceived um, as um, scientific enough, um, as deterministic enough, to, to use a word that Claude Bernard um, had uh, used as, as a um, um, somewhat a, um, a war metaphor uh, from the 19th century, um, a clinical, uh, from, from a physiological laboratory vis a vis. Um, the clinical colleagues at the time. Um, so um, I often sense um, a tension there between the laboratory scientists and um, the clinical researchers. 
And um, it is also a context um, in which um, social medicine and public health um, often have a hard um, um, standing and um, need to legitimize um, themselves more um, uh, in saying that they're not uh, primarily concerned with the individual um, uh, person uh, that is ill in the hospital, and they're not directly concerned um, with giving an answer in the laboratory to a specific question, but that their project is a social one, increasing the health of a population, for example, uh, a group or containing uh, an epidemic, um, uh, spreading disease, um, which is all outside of hospital walls. Um, so the question is, what is actually, where, where are the boundaries, what is actually the subject, um, and um, does it follow the sole heel of biomedical educational curriculum uh, in major research universities and um, also um, technological institutes. Um, so I guess um, uh, that will be something um, that I hope um, Situating Science Cluster um, can bring on the table um, and to the discussion um, with policymakers, uh, with administrators um, of universities and colleges in Canada, um, that we actually need more um, of this uh, form of discourse um, sort of inserted um, into um, the curricula throughout the country and um, also involve the students as early uh, on as possible um, in this discourse um, in reflecting um, on um, this, um, as Lauden said, um, thing we call science, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. to, uh, to understand um, what it also involves beyond uh, the mere uh, technical knowledge, uh, of course, um, that's acquired um, uh, in uh, university forms uh, of training. Uh, secondary. Um, so I guess um, situating science has done a lot, um, but um, I hope that in the future we'll see more of this, uh, in fact, and also an acknowledgement uh, for the work um, that situating science uh, cluster has done um, for um, the community uh, and um, also for um, higher education and uh, together. You know, I've, I've spoken, or I've, I've had the opportunity, the fabulous opportunity, to speak to uh, quite a few members of this this admittedly small group of people who are engaged in this kind of work in Canada and, uh, as a result of my involvement with the Situating Science Grant. And uh, that's such a common theme that I've heard throughout is that everyone, everyone who's involved say, what a fabulous project it is. They've been exposed to other people's work, and it's really emphasized for them how important this work is, but it also has underscored for them how much more we need to do, like that this is just really an initial first step, and that there, this needs to happen like on such a bigger scale, and it's so, so important right now. Um, and I feel like that's kind of the theme that comes out from everyone involved right now. Uh, uh, so, and I, I fully agree. Even I, I, And it's also very funny, I feel like the other thing that's come out is that for so many of us who are interested in this kind of work, we all kind of stumbled into it in some way. It, it wasn't kind of a direct path. Uh, I myself got interested in this work in part because I was a microbiologist who um, took an elective a philosophy course that is an elective because I needed an essay credit mm -hmm. you know and uh, it happened that we ended up doing some philosophy of medicine in that course and but it just so happened right and um, uh, and I fell down the rabbit hole like so many others uh, but it it is this thing where it really seems to me that um, it is quite a problem that that we end up leaving the introduction of these kind of ideas for science students and engineers to these electives, right, to these yeah. optional bits at the end. Uh, and that it really does seem to me to, to need to be part of our core thinking about science. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, um, again, it's something, you know, these kind of themes are coming together <laughs> through this project that everyone seems to really kind of focus on or come down on and agree on. So uh, I, I think it's, that's a beautiful kind of place for us to end. <laughs> this thing that kind of keeps always coming out. Um, 
Anyway, so let me just finish by thanking you so much for taking the time to talk to me today. Uh, and this has been a wonderful discussion. Uh, and I hope for everyone else who views it, they'll, they'll uh, get as much out of it as I did. I'm sure they will. Yes. It was a pleasure. And um, thank you very much for having me. And um, of course, thinking about the cluster, um, uh, we incredibly hope um, that uh, our engagement with um, also the University of Alberta will continue and uh, that we see more uh, fruits developing from that. Um, so okay. thanks very much for this interview. Great. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thank you.